Uh, well, welcome everybody uh, to uh, this talk we're having this evening. Um, welcome particularly to members of uh, the Southampton CA and also to our guests from Bristol CA and Guildford CA. Um, I believe that Lytham St. Anne's, uh, I invited them, uh, but however, they've got you again, I believe, Ben, uh, in February. That's right. Yeah. Uh, doing the, the same talk. So they've decided to wait and see you for the first time then. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my great, oh, before we start, uh, if you, any of you have a problem, uh, when you go to the bottom of your screen, uh, you can see if you if you want to contact somebody because you've got into technical difficulties, you've got the chat symbol at the bottom, which you can click on, and we can try and help you if there's a real problem. Also at the bottom there, there is Q&A. Uh, if any of you during the talk uh, want to actually send a question through, um, Jackie will pick those up at the end of uh, Ben's talk and then we can sort out who's going to ask the questions. Uh, but please don't ask questions during the talk itself. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome an old friend uh, of the association, the Southampton branch of the association. Uh, we had the pleasure of having uh, Ben talk on uh, AD9, uh, we're talking about the great uh, difficulties that Rome had against the Germans. Um, many of us at that time uh, had either read some of, that, some of this uh, trilogy on that, uh, and I'm sure others have uh, caught up with the, the whole story. Uh, this evening, um, Ben is going to be talking on the Clash of Empires, Rome versus Macedon. Uh, I believe there are two books in that particular series. Um, I've got both of them and I'm looking forward with great pleasure after I've heard uh, Ben's talk uh, to reading those over the, the Christmas break. So Ben, may I hand over to you now at this particular point. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Great, thank, thank you, Tony. I'm just going to see if I can share my screen, which I should be able to. Okay, is that, can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, thank you to Tony and to Jackie Meredith and um, James Clark of the Southampton CA for inviting me tonight and looking after me, getting everything set up. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Just a shame that, um, the year that's in it, I can't give you the talk in person, but um, here we are tonight anyway. And um, the first thing I'll say is that strictly speaking, this talk shouldn't be termed Clash of Empires because of course, in the year 200 BC, Rome was still a republic. <laughs> and Macedon wasn't really big enough to be an empire either, but um, it's a good title. And it's a, it's a curious little war. Uh, it was big in the area, but in the scheme of wars with world history, it was a, a little war really considering the sizes of the armies that were involved. And it's, it's something that I still find strange that it's actually so little known today. This was a meeting of the growing power that was Rome against the fading power that was Macedon. It was the meeting of Greece and Rome, two of the most important civilizations to affect European history and indeed to some uh, extent world history because of their effects on with lack to do with language science um, legal systems and so on a, a massive seismic event in the Mediterranean world that left a, a lasting effect on us because it meant that Rome continued on its march forward and yet you know if you ask most people say that you ask them about ancient Rome someone in the street They'll tell you about emperors and legions and Hadrian's Wall and gladiators and, and maybe the Latin. And if you ask them about ancient Greece, they'll tell you about Olympic Games and hopefully they'll say Thermopylae and Marathon and maybe Salamis and some Aristotle and Plato. If you ask them about when those two powers met, you're invariably met with sometimes just a blank stare, uh, which is really, really, um, it's a real shame because it's a fascinating little period of history. 
So, um, sorry, I just need to get my, so that's the sequel, that's the second book, uh, that's the first book. Um, that's the proof that I am actually a veterinary surgeon, although I haven't practiced for nearly 12 years now. I've had 14 novels published. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the rise to power of Rome um, in the century before the sort of two, 65 years, sorry, not quite a century, 65, 70 year period before its clash with Macedon because it's very important to understand the politics of the Mediterranean at this time. Now, being members of the Classics Association, you're probably much more well-versed in this than, than most people, but I'll, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just run through it a little bit though to set the scene as it were. So that area of shaded red is what Rome controlled in the year 264 BC. Now uh, you'll know that this was an important year because it was when the first war with the power um, Carthage started. So there were three great wars with Carthage. Obviously the second one was against Hannibal and the third one saw the um, annihilation of Carthage as, a, as, a, as an entity. But in 264 BC, the Romans who had spent uh, roughly the previous 150 years, a little bit longer maybe, but roughly that period, conquering the peoples of central and southern Italy, uh, and literally on, a, on an ad hoc basis. But they didn't control northern Italy, and they most certainly didn't control the area um, you know, that, that abuts up onto the Alps mountains, and they had no foreign territories whatsoever. And therefore their rise to power in 103 years, because by 161 BC, they had subjugated Macedon for a second time um, fully. And, and therefore cemented their position in the Mediterranean. In, a, in that 103 year period, they went from, from this state that controlled not even all of modern day Italy to a power that controlled the whole Mediterranean. So what were the other powers in the Mediterranean at this time in 264? They were um, that horrible sort of mustard color which was the Seleucid Empire, which stretched from the uh, eastern shores of the Mediterranean all the way to India. Again, don't worry too much if you can't read the places, just that mustard yellow is the Seleucid Empire. You had the um, Ptolemaic Egypt, which is uh, the sort of li lilac color there. Uh, these, remember, were remnants of Alexander the Great's empire. When he died, uh, still as a young man, his empire splintered almost immediately with his powerful, most powerful generals seizing various parts of it. Seleucus taking the Seleucid Empire, Ptolemy took Egypt. You had the Lysimachian uh, area, which is that orangey uh, area uh, in Western Turkey and in Bulgaria, but that was gone by 264 BC. You had Macedon, the lime green area there, that was seized by one of his generals, and this was still a power in 264 BC. So Egypt, Seleucid Empire, Macedon, Italy slash Rome and you had just you can see a tiny little bit of purple there on the on the left hand edge of the screen you had Carthage which was actually um, controlled the whole western Mediterranean so there were five powers uh, in the Mediterranean 264 the two biggest by far were Carthage and the Seleucid Empire and yet 103 years later there were only two of them left those two being Ptolemaic Egypt, which was sick and ill like Turkey in 1914, the sick man of Europe it was called. Ptolemaic Egypt was, was not a powerful power, it was very weak. Carthage was pretty much subjugated uh, or, or reduced totally in power. The Seleucids were not gone, but they'd withdrawn, they'd been beaten back from the Mediterranean and Macedon was gone because Greece was under Roman power. So these were very definitely the first steps to empire that Rome took because um, they had now had vast overseas territories that required permanent military garrisons. Um, and at the time, Rome's armies were still volunteer, men who expected to go home every autumn if they could. So this is where the sense of being a Roman citizen is important um, to bring in. Res publica, republic, it means public affair. It means that we all have a civic duty to play our part. And in these days of, um, you know, if you, live all the, if you live in Southampton, you live in Guildford, um, you know, live in Bristol, all you've got to do to live in a city nowadays is, is pay your council tax um, and pay maybe for a parking permit. You don't have to line up and join the militia of that city. And yet in this 
period of the mid republic this was an intimate part of being a roman citizen when rome called its sons to war you volunteered as part of your duty and you most often did it uh, did it willingly it wasn't just the ordinary men who would fight the nobles would go to war as well whether it was in the cavalry or as generals and perhaps the most famous example of um, Roman sense of duty was the Roman noble. Um, it's going a little bit further back even to about the um, 6th century BC or 5th. And there was a man called Cincinnatus, Cincinnati in Ohio being named after him. And he was renowned in Roman history, revered because his sense of uh, public duty was such that when the Romans were fighting an enemy and um, during his, you know, his lifetime and he'd, he'd been a successful general before, they were doing really badly so he was approached by the senate and asked to take the dictatorship which was a period of six months where he would be allowed to, to do what he want to lead rome's forces militarily and, and command the whole republic and it obviously gives rise to the modern term dictator and you know you can abuse that yet kinkinatus's sense of duty was such that he went to war defeated rome's enemies in 15 days and went back we are told to plowing his fields uh, and this was his, you know, because he wasn't interested in taking power, he would just do his duty for Rome. So the sense of, of being a Roman um, was very, very strong at this time. During the first Punic War uh, between Rome and Carthage, when Rome lost a massive fleet off the island of Sicily, the senators, the 300 rich men who, who, who formed the ruling body of Rome, the politicians, if you like, they actually paid for a new fleet to be constructed out of their own pockets. Now, many members of parliament in Britain today are millionaires. When was the last time you saw them doing passing a hat around to raise money for coronavirus, each of them donating a million pounds? You know, never is the answer. Um, so it's, it's a real difference. It's an important thing to note about the Romans of the time, that there was, um, you know, that they were very, very civic minded. That's an image um, by a friend of mine, Sean O'Brogon, of the Campus Martius outside Rome. There are uh, senior officers who were essentially just rich nobles. Uh, they became the leaders of armies. Um, you can see the red, the red um, band around the armor there on a couple of them that shows that they're uh, at least legate rank. And um, men in ordinary tunics, farmers, uh, presenting themselves for military duty. Um, this is uh, what the uh, the territory of Carthage looked like when the first war took place between um, uh, Rome and Carthage. They also controlled the islands of Sicily, or at least half of it, as well as Sardinia and Corsica. Roll forward another 20, 30 years, you've got Hannibal Barca and the second war with Carthage. You all know about that. You probably heard, I'm sure you've heard of Cannae um, and his master tactics there in the summer of 216 BC. Uh, when he wiped out an, uh, uh, an army of between 70 and 90,000 Roman legionaries with, with an army about half that size. He was undone in the end, however, having um, his, his, his fellow generals in Spain had lost, uh, the, the Carthaginians fighting in Sicily had lost, Hannibal himself in Italy was still undefeated, but he was basically backed into a corner down in the south and the man who became known as uh, he was Scipio, Scipio Africanus later in life, a man who'd studied Hannibal's tactics right through the war um, from when he was a, a, a teenage boy and the son of one of the other generals who fought Hannibal and was beaten by him. But he became very, very successful in his, in his own right, invaded Carthage. Hannibal was called back by his people to come and defend his homeland. And in the autumn of 202 BC, he faced a much better army under Scipio than he had himself because he hadn't had the ships to bring his own men back from Italy. So he had a scratch force, he had untrained war elephants, and when his elephants, the battering rams of ancient times, charged Scipio's legionaries, they were drilled well enough just to open, you can see there, they opened gaps in their ranks and allowed the terrified elephants to, to run through. And they, they, they beat Hannibal that day, and that was effectively the end of the Second Punic War, which brings us to, to two years before this momentous war between Carthage, or sorry, between Macedon and Greece. So that brings us finally to the center stage, uh, the two characters, um, or three characters, four characters really, but the main uh, Macedonian character, um, who was Philip V. Now, he was the king. Uh, he was not a descendant of Alexander the Great. He was an Antigonid, 
This, this was a family that had taken power a few generations before, so some decades after uh, Alexander the Great's death. And uh, he, was, he was a curious man, a very interesting character. Uh, so it was normal, as you can see from the coin, it was normal for Greek monarchs to have their image on the coin. At the time, it was not acceptable, very rarely anyway, for Roman officials to have their faces on coins because it showed aspirations of kingship, more of which later. But Philip V was a man who was born, if you like, to war. Um, Macedon was universally hated within Greece. It still is to some extent. If any of you know of um, the Republic of North Macedonia, as it's now known, what was called Macedonia in Yugoslavia in, in communist times, um, it's only recently uh, changed its name. So its name was Macedonia and the Greeks since the 90s have blocked its accession to NATO and to the EU because they object so strongly to it calling itself Macedonia, even though that's what it is. It is, it is most of what was Macedonia in ancient times. And the reason the Greeks hated, and to some extent it has lingered, um, hate the Macedonians is because of um, Alexander's father, who was called Philip II. He conquered Greece and then Alexander, you know, stamped his foot on top of that uh, and controlled all of Greece during his, uh, his period uh, of power. And right through then, for a good hundred years and more afterwards, Macedon continued to exert huge control over Greece. They didn't control it all, but they controlled most of it. And uh, they did this basically through brute force. But Philip V's enemies were not just within Greece. Now he had allies as well, who I'll mention later on, but he had enemies everywhere. He had enemies to the north, um, essentially, um, you can see there again don't worry too much if you can't read all the places but you can you'll know um if you see the fingers there of the halkadiki peninsula um which are uh, in the middle of the map up near the top or you can see pella which was the capital of, of macedon north north of macedon there you had dardania and thrake or thrace so essentially modern day bulgaria the tribes in the up there they hated the macedonians too and would fight them at the drop of a hat and to the west of macedon you had Illyria and Epirus, um, and this is essentially modern day Albania and moving up into Montenegro and a little bit of southern Croatia. And the tribes there weren't too fond of the Macedonians either. And then if you went across the Aegean to Asia Minor or Western Turkey, you had, uh, as you know, I'm sure, a massive number of different powers vying for control in that area. There were, there were cities that held allegiance to the, to, to the Ptolemies of Egypt. Loads of the city-states of Greece had individual cities and towns. Uh, then you had the power that was Rhodes. Um, that was a power that had, had risen after the fall of Alexander as well. And you also had Pergamum, which you can, I hope you can read there on the screen. That was um, a power that had, had a regional power in the area too. And so there was, though most of the peoples in that area also disliked Philip or, or had problems with him because he had invaded their lands. And so he was, um, he was a king who had enemies to the north, south, east and west. And a bit like a very large animal, if you're to, to talk about it in hunting terms, perhaps to think of a wild boar, that's being attacked by a pack of dogs that are owned by hunters. He's fine, he'll kill one dog, no problem. But if he, he, he sinks his, or you know, gores one, um, one dog, another dog can grab onto his back leg and another dog can grab onto you know, maybe his belly. So Philip spent much of his reign marching and sailing east, north, south and west, often at lightning speed, often with great success, fighting his enemies. But he may have been good at that. He was also really, really capable of making massively stupid decisions, as I will explain uh, during the series, you know, during the, uh, the the events of this war. And he was also capable of acts of of great cruelty, uh, just like most rulers of the time, uh, and also um, of acts of of you know compassion and so on. He was a very very interesting man, and um, he was somebody that should have known better than to pick a fight with Rome. And so in 202 BC, which was the year you had this momentous battle of Zama between Hannibal and um, 
uh, and Scipio Africanus, as he was to be called later because of that success. Philip V was, uh, he spent the campaigning um, period of that year, which is roughly April to September, over in, in Asia Minor. And he, he basically, he didn't have a really, really big fleet. He had, and he had a, quite a small fleet, which is one of his problems. Because if you're going to make war on, on, on city-states um, that are across the sea, you really need a big fleet. And he didn't have many of the triremes, which you can see, um, that's your classic trireme there in the right-hand picture. He, he only had a few of those, and he had mostly had much smaller ships. And during the summer of 202 BC, he sailed up and down that coast of of Western Turkey, basically being a complete pain in the backside to the powers, particularly Pergamum. Uh, he, he besieged Pergamum, but didn't have the, enough forces or siege equipment to maintain a proper, invest a proper siege and had to retreat before he ran out of supplies. He was also up at the Hellespont, up near Abydos, uh, and, and um, indeed sailing into the, into the Dardanelles, um, and generally just making nuisance of himself, capturing and burning cities and so on. Uh, and he was such so annoying that um, Pergamum, which was a city-state, uh, and also the roads, although it's further down there to the south, they had quite a few um, um, cities under their control in this area. They actually sent an embassy to Rome asking for help against Philip. Now, it's worth mentioning at this point that the Romans and Philip V did actually have a history of beef, to use the modern term. They did have a bad history. There had been a brief uh, a sort of stop-start war between Rome and, and Macedon in the years 215 to 207. So during the Second Punic War with Hannibal, there were hostilities between um, Macedon and Rome. And that had come about uh, after um, a ship that had been uh, carrying messages between Philip and Hannibal. So the two of them were attempting to form an alliance, and the theory was that um, Hannibal, who was still in southern Italy after Cannae, would await the arrival by sea from um, Illyria, or modern-day Croatia, of Philip with his men. Remember, it's only 80 miles from Italy to Croatia, and that they, Philip would cross over to Italy and join Hannibal. And Unfortunately for them, and this is one of those great what if moments, a Roman ship happened to, a military vessel happened to stop the ship that was carrying this message of this putative treaty. And we know about this from the Romans. So in 215, they found this out and they were very unhappy. The alliance never came to anything. But what did happen was the Romans, who were obviously under the cosh with Hannibal, but they dispatched a small naval force to Illyria where they engaged in hostilities with Philip's forces. Now, it was, a re as I said, a real stop-start affair. There were um, clashes all the way around nearly to Athens during the eight years that followed, but months and even years could go by where nothing happened. The Romans weren't able to send many troops to um, fight with the Greeks. The main Greek uh, civilization that um, started uh, or joined with the Romans was Aetolia. So I hope, I hope you can, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's essentially north of the Peloponnese, north of the Corinthian Gulf there, west of Delphi, there was a city-state called Aetolia, and they were quite powerful at this time, and they hated Macedon more than most people, and they joined with the Romans during this weird on-off war between 215 and 207 which came to not very much. By the end of that war, when there was a peace treaty conducted, the Romans were more or less, hadn't lost very much. Philip hadn't really, he gained perhaps a little and the Aetolians had lost some territory. But there was definitely a history of aggression between uh, um, Philip and Rome. Uh, and, and I'll go back to my point. I think he should have known better, knowing the size of the army that Rome had. Um, I mean, they had over 100,000 men in uniform, if you like, by the end of this war. And Philip V's army was never much bigger than about 25,000 men. And this, the, the army that Rome had was experienced as well. You know, many of those soldiers had served for more than 10 years. Uh, so it was a, a, you know, a formidable enemy that he was taking on. So. I'll roll forward to 200 BC uh, when the war actually started. Um, there we have the, 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 the same slide I showed you earlier, the, the gathering of the men um, to assemble to join the army. So 
in the Republic at this time, Rome could not go to war, the Senate could not take Rome to war without the approval of the people as well. So the Senate could vote for war, which they did in the summer of 200 BC. They decided finally to listen to the Aetolians and the Pergamenes, and the Senate decided they would, they would open hostilities with Philip. But when the vote was put to the centurionate, now that's not the, um, uh, sorry, the centuriate, I should say, that, that's not to do with the centurions in the army. It was what was called, what the groupings of all the tribes of Rome uh, was called when they gathered together on the plain of Mars for an important vote like this, and they voted individually as tribes, and then uh, each tribe had one vote, and you had to get approval for, in this case, war before it could go through. And guess what? When that vote was taken in the summer of 200 BC, after the Senate had given its approval for war, the people of Rome rejected it. And that's a really, really telling point. And it's one of those things that is very frustrating because the sources, the ancient texts, literally describe this in about two lines. And when I read that, I was immediately thinking, why? Like, why did that happen? Um, and the answer to me, although because the sources are silent, we can't prove it. I think this, the answer is, is, is stare, stares us in the face. It is that the men, these were the men who would go and have to join the legions, or indeed were still in the legions, or their sons were, or their brothers and fathers were. These were men who had seen 17 years of war against Hannibal. They had lived through um, Hannibal marching up and down in Italy, you know, doing whatever he liked had lost relations, possibly entire families that, of their own in the battle at, at Cannae and so on. So the Roman citizenry was sick and tired of war. Imagine if the British prime minister had asked Britain to go to war 18 months after VE Day or VJ Day in 1945. I don't think he would have got a yes vote from, from the British population. And that was after only six years of war. Now, when did you ever know politicians to listen to what the people say? Because um, it didn't end there. A few months later, the vote was taken again. The Senate voted for war. And this time, the tribes uh, did vote for war as well. They voted yes. They changed their mind. And we have no idea why. Uh, I'll refer you to the Gracchi brothers in the 130s BC. I'll refer you to the street brutality um, during the rise to power of Julius Caesar, when he was rivals with Pompey Magnus and with Crassus, and you had armed gangs beating up and murdering people in, in Rome itself. Those are all events after this time, so um, well after this time in the case of Caesar, Pompey and Crassus. So I have no doubt that a lot of skullduggery will have gone on. That's how I chose to portray it in my novel, that there was, there was bribery and there were people being beaten up and threatened with worse if they didn't change their minds. But, but the simple answer is we don't know. What we do know is that um, despite being sick of all those losses, um, the Romans sent an army over to uh, uh, Illyria, Apollonia, in fact, the city of Apollonia, which is a ruin that you can still visit today, that summer. Now, it was highly unusual to open a war in mid to late summer back then, because as you all know, wars were generally fought and even when Hannibal was in Italy, the hostilities usually only took place in the spring and summer because everyone needed to sow crops and everyone needed to harvest crops. And also winters are cold and miserable and wet, even, you know, not like they are in Britain, but, you know, not good campaigning weather. And where did you get your food in the wintertime? So it was very unusual to do what the Romans did, which was to send a force over to Illyria in, in September 200 BC under the command of a man called Sulpicius Galba, who was an elderly man in his 60s, but he had served as consul once at least uh, uh, in the war with Hannibal, and therefore was you know, experienced to some level anyway. And keen to uh, have an initial success, he sent some of his troops up the river Apsus uh, to the city of Antipatria, which is called Berat in modern day Albania. And I'll, there'll be a picture of that later on. Uh, and they sacked that town and almost definitely just withdrew back down to the coastline because those mountains there between um, Albania, Montenegro and so on uh, into Macedon, um, to modern day Macedon, they're very high. 
there are nearly 3,000 meters, some of them. And when the snow falls, um, it, it blocks off all the, pa the passes. And it was only in the 20th century that those passes um, were, were you know, literally open in the winter time. Up to then, um, they would be closed from first heavy snowfall till April, May. So 2,200 uh, years ago, you did not want to be on the wrong side of those mountains. And in other words, on the Macedonian side, uh, when the snow fell. So Galba pulled his men back down to the camps around Apollonia, where he overwintered. Now, Philip, um, who had an army, as I mentioned, of about 25,000 men, he was in a really difficult position immediately because there were various river passes. You can see one there called, uh, where there's the River Apsis. There's another one north of it, where, um, there's a river called the Genusus. These are all the Latin names. Um, and then below that, uh, below Apollonia, you can see the river Aus. So there were three passes the Romans could try to come through, or they could march south into Epirus um, and come down to um, where there were literally, the mountains got very low and they could just march into Thessaly. And the Thessaly, as you know, central Greece is flat. And from there, you can march up north up towards Macedon. So Philip was faced with this dilemma of having to defend potentially four, maybe even five approaches into his land with an army that at full strength was only just big enough to fight what the Romans had. They had about 25,000 men um, um, waiting to, to invade in the spring of 199 BC. So just a quick word about the armies. Um, the Roman legionaries of the mid-republic were very different to your what most people are used to from TV. <laughs> well, most depictions on TV are horrific, but they're usually uh, imperial period legionaries. So these are very different. There were actually four types of soldier in each legion. The Polybian legion, as it was known, is, is usually recognized, that's thanks to the Polybius, the historian, it's usually recognized as being 4,200 um, men, maybe a bit bigger, but 4,200 is, is the most commonly held uh, um, number. 4,200 infantry, 300 cavalry, so 4,500 uh, men in total. Now they were divided, the infantry, into four classes, and these were men who would take those positions according to their age and their wealth and their social status. So all Roman citizens, obviously, the youngest and the poorest, were called velites, that's the chap second from the left, singular in Latin is veles, a teenager of maybe 17 or 18, 19, no money. So all he had was a, a shield and a few spears. If he was lucky, a sword. And they were skirmishers who ran out in front of the army through their spears while the enemy skirmishers or slingshot, um, men with slingshots did the same. And then they were, they were also used as scouts. And then they would run back behind the safety of the, of the legions. And the legions were ranked in three rows. Um, the first rank was made up of men in their 20s called um, Hastati, singular Hastatus, that's the man on the left there. These are men in their early 20s who didn't have the money for any heavy armor, so they just had a thing called a pectorale, which was a piece of bronze, square of bronze, front and back of your chest that just protects your heart and lungs. Massively big shields, much bigger than your imperial shield and also curved top and bottom. Very simple Montefortino helmets, one greave metal armor between the knee and the ankle, and, and a horrifically long sword called the Gladius Hispaniensis, a good 10 inches uh, longer than the sword you're used to seeing in imper with imperial period legionaries. So 1,200 of them in the front rank of each legion, 1,200 men in the second rank called princapes, singular princaps, um, that's the chap on the right there. The only difference really between them and the first rank is that they had male shirts and uh, under which they wore a padded tunic. And so the combination of the two acted very much like a stab proof vest. So these were um, very heavy infantry um, used to battering their way through pretty much anything, except Hannibal's army, of course, <laughs> but they had beaten in the end. The third rank known as triari, um, singular triarius, were men in their thirties and there are only 600 of them in each legion, and they were the creme de la creme, the veterans of each legion used only in extremis. And the lovely expression survives from this time, from the Punic, Second Punic War in Latin, rem ad triarius redice, and it means matters have come to the triari. In other words, the first and second ranks of running away or they're dead, please send in the third rank or we're all going up a certain creek without a paddle. 
And so this was what your Roman legion looked like. That's the cavalryman there, the, the Republican cavalryman, a young nobleman who would have furnished his own equipment. He uh, may have had a saddle, but during this period, almost definitely only wore a saddle blanket, no stirrups, um, that wonderful Boeotian helmet, which is copied from the Greeks uh, with a horse hair or feathered uh, crest, a male shirt slit at the sides um, on his thighs to allow movement for, you know, when he was riding, a spear as his primary weapon. The horses they rode were really small. I remember most men were only about five foot seven or 1.65 meters, and they rode what we would regard as ponies today. But that's not to say that cavalry wasn't immensely important for scouting and also as uh, a battering ram in battle. That's me dressed as an astatus. Um, most Romans did not wear red tunics. Um, they did wear red tunics, but it's also thought they wore cream and blue and green and so on, and we don't actually really know. Um, that's the Battle of Zama, just to sort of repeat uh, how effective the Romans were. And this is um, to start talking a little bit about the Macedonian army. So you'll all know the word phalanx and you'll know the story of Thermopylae and the Spartans and how the, all Greek city-states fought in phalanxes during the glory days, the fifth century, um, the, the Peloponnesian War and so on. Um, the great big round shield that was potentially about a meter across with a, a stabbing spear that was two meters, maybe three meters, so six to nine feet long. And they all locked their shields and, and walked forward, um, you know, thrusting their spears over overhand or overhead, I should say. Their left and right sides being very weak because um, they were exposed because they were all looking forward. So they needed light troops left and right. Well, um, Alexander the Great's father, Philip II, changed the Macedonian phalanx. Um, in a major way. He armed his men with the Sarissa spear. That is an 18 to 20 foot long spear, six, five to 6.5 meters long. That bend in the middle is natural because you can't have a spear that long where the wood doesn't actually bend. It was, it was made of two pieces which you glue, which you screwed together. You can possibly see the joint there in the middle of that one on the left. And, um, when the men of the phalanx stood together, these are, this is the only um, reenactment unit I know of in the world. They're Germans, bizarrely, who reenact Macedonian phalangists. You can see, you can get the impression of how long those spears are. Um, what we know is that, and this is from the late great Peter Connolly's book, it's the only image I could get, so apologies for the writing, but what we know uh, the Macedonian phalanx did was that the first five ranks um, of men the basic unit being 16 men wide and 16 deep, but then, you know, uh, uh, multiplied up into much bigger numbers, that the first five ranks when they were marching into battle would lower their spears forward in that manner there. And that essentially presented the enemy with a hedgehog spine wall that you couldn't get anywhere near. Um, and the men in the ranks behind would hold up their spears, as you see there. And what that meant was that if you were raining down arrows on them or throwing spears at them, that as those spears came in to land, a lot of them would actually hit the raised up uh, Macedonian weapons and be robbed of some of their force or their direction. And so they wouldn't hurt or kill as many men. So the Macedonian phalanx was absolutely kind of unstoppable if it was on the in the right place at the right time. It was known as the, um, potentially, there was, there's a Greek saying you could refer to, it, which is that the hedgehog um, has a great uh, trick, but he's only got one trick, and that's to roll up in a ball. And the Macedonian phalanx could be argued, it, it was a great um, offensive weapon, but it was literally the only thing they could do. And if, as I'll describe to you, they something happened that they weren't prepared for, then they would be completely undone. Now, cavalry was important to the Greeks as well. So Philip had um, companion cavalrymen. They weren't used uh, to the same extent as, as Alexander the Great did. You'll know that he used his companions as means to win a lot of his battles. Um, that's my friend John Conyard, a wonderful reenactor. You can see he's got, he's just no saddle, uh, no, no saddle blanket, no stirrups. He and his, um, his riders literally uh, can ride around an arena planting spears in bales of hay no difficulty at all from 30 or 40 paces and they've only been training at you know this kind of thing for maybe 20 years if you were put on a horse when, as a small boy um you would you would be an innate horseman this is a, a picture it's it is one of alexander's battle it's the battle of the granicus um 
with the companion cavalry charging. Um, the, the spears that the companions used were called Ziston spears, X-Y-S-T-O-N, and they were up about five meters long. So long you needed two hands to hold them. So you let go of the reins of your horse while you were charging. I didn't have a shield or anything. I mean, it's just, it's kind of insane to us. Philip also had, so he had some thousands of cavalrymen, but not as many as, as, the, um, as his enemies, because the Aetolians by now had joined with the Romans and they had uh, several thousand horsemen. So he was, he was potentially weak in cavalry. He also had thousands of ordinary um, uh, hoplites. Uh, so although that's a silver shield um, from the magazine Ancient Warfare, one of Alexander's crack troops, I couldn't find a a good image of, of uh, a hoplite without a silver shield, but take away the silver shield and you've got a Greek hoplite of the period. Um, they also look like, that's John Conyard again, the man on the right. Some of them wouldn't have even had armor if they were just simple farmers, simple Pelos helmet, just a spear and a shield as the main weapon. So these would have been men who guarded the flanks of um, Philip's phalanx, which it's worth noting was 16,000 men strong. So a massive, massive hedgehog. He also had some thousands of tribesmen from the hills um, of Dardania and Thrace. So these would have been, you know, sort of barbarians to the Greeks. Uh, men with pelte shields. They look like they've had a bite taken out of them. Just spears and knives probably as their weapons. Uh, and these would have been skirmishers and scouts. Uh, you can even see a couple of Scythians there in the background. Whether he would have had any of them, I don't know. But they were in this image from I got from John Conyard. Uh, and so... These were, these were non, despite their you know, non-armored appearance and the fact that uh, they wouldn't have been particularly disciplined, it's not to say these men weren't very dangerous and effective at ambushes and so on. That's Berat in, in modern day Albania I mentioned earlier. And in the spring of 199 BC, um, the, the army of Galba came up um, the, the, the river passes, uh, sorry, the river pass, not of, of where Berat was, but up the river Apsus. Um, one of the other pa passes I mentioned. That's what those passes look like. Terribly narrow, very easy to defend if you've got a big army, if you've got a phalanx and if you build a barrier. So um, despite the fact that Philip almost definitely must have built barriers, we don't know this because again, the sources are silent. What we do know is that Galba's men smashed through one of these passes in the summer, late spring, early summer of 199 BC, and they made their way up into, um, I'm going back a bit here, sorry, up into uh, Mac Western Macedonia. I should have had a second map there. So you can see the, the, there, is, um, there is a place called Otolobus. That is where the, the Romans were victorious, smashed through um, the, the Macedonian army. And you then had a summer of skirmishing in Western Macedonia, um, where the Romans were trying to force the Macedonians into battle on their terms and Philip's army was trying to face the Romans on their terms. Now phalanx needs to fight on flat ground because um, mountainous ground means that the, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't work. They, they need flat ground where, with their flanks protected. And there was cat and mouse all summer. The Macedonians had some uh, success at a place called Pluina, which is there on the map, although that's a putative location. Uh, but coming towards harvest time, September, Galba hadn't won enough ground or inflicted enough casualties on the Macedonians to warrant risking staying in Macedonia. So he again pulled back through the mountains to the coast at Apollonia. Now his time was running out. Uh, although he was uh, the general in charge of the campaign, what he didn't know was that the new consul, uh, whose name was Vilius Tapulus, um, wanted to take control of the campaign. So what happened was that in the autumn winter of 199 BC, Tapulus came over from Italy and relieved Galba of his command, which he must have been very annoyed about. But what Tapulus didn't know was that the New Year's consul, who was this man here, Flamininus, consuls being elected early in the New Year. So early in, in 198, um, uh, Tapulus hadn't even had chance to lead his army into Macedonia. Over from Italy came Flamininus, who was a really young man. He was only in his 30s, which is very young to take control, uh, to be consul um, and also to take control of a, of a war. But that's what he did. 
and he was a remarkable character. So highly unusual at the time for a Roman to speak Greek and to write it, yet Flamininus could. He was he was a he, he loved um, Greek uh, or Greek I should say and Gr Greek things and Greek culture, and yet he's the man that essentially <laughs> defeated Greece and took it and Macedon and took it for for Rome. Um, he, we know he was able to write Greek because a portion of a letter he wrote survives. Now, it's apparently full of grammatical errors, but the fact is he could do what nearly no Roman of the time could. So he took command in the spring of 198 BC and he um, advanced up the river Apsus um, Valley. And there, there was a standoff, presumably because of a barricade between his army and Philip's army for about six weeks. And we're told, you never know with these sources, there was a face-to-face -face meeting between Philip and, and Flamininus. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It's always remarkable how the major um, protagonists tend to meet each other. Uh, but it's, it's a gift to a novelist when you, when you read of a meeting between the two generals. And we don't um, know how it came about, but the way the Romans got through this blockage was very much a la Thermopylae. So you'll know that the Persians uh, managed to get around behind the Spartans and their allies because an unfortunate shepherd who probably got tortured um, or were given enough gold or both, um, uh, you know, the one, the one before and the one after, led the, led the Persians around the, the, the Spartans' position. Well, the same happened here. Um, we don't know who it was or we don't know his name, but someone led a, a force of Romans up and around, up, you know, goat tracks, um, narrow, narrow little tracks up and around behind the Macedonian position. And uh, when there was a smoke signal, obviously arranged for a particular time, the Romans launched an attack on the, on the um, Macedonian position from the front and behind. There was panic and they broke through. Philip's army had to retreat in, in massive confusion and what that meant was then Flamininus' army was uh, was all the way into 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 Western Macedonia. Now uh, it wasn't to say that he was going to meet with um, complete success, because um, although he forced um, Philip to retreat towards the borders of Macedon, and he adopted a torch uh, slash and burn policy where he literally burned the crops in the fields of Thessaly rather than see the Romans have them. I wasn't, he wasn't able to defend Thessaly. Uh, he didn't feel he could. And, and southern Macedonia, is there are mountains there too. So he retreated into the, the mountainous girdle uh, around Macedon. And we don't know the details, but there was a, a Macedonian fortress in the autumn of, of 198 uh, BC where, called Atrax, where um, the Romans suffered a, sh a sharp defeat. Now we know very little details about it, but it, it, some historians think it's where the way I portrayed it is that um, the Romans broke their way into this fortress where they, we know that there were um, several thousand of Philip's phalangists, the, the, the men who served in the, in the phalanx, and that in the narrow confines of a courtyard, um, the Romans weren't able to defeat the, the phalanx. Now, there must have been more to it than that, but we don't know. But what we do know is that, is that hostilities came to an end in the autumn of 198. But importantly, um, Flamininus did not retreat from, from Macedon. So he was secure enough in himself with his Aetolian allies to the south, able to bring in supplies that way. Um, and uh, knowing that he, his army hadn't been defeated, obviously, badly, only, it must have only been a partial defeat, he stayed in Thessaly for the winter. And that was effectively the beginning of the end. Um, now, I'll just, I will tell you what happened at the end, but um, just a quick word about that book on the left, uh, E.W. Wallbank's uh, biography of Philip V of Macedon. Um, it was a curious twist of fate. It was, it was published in 1939, and in 1940 and won a, a prestigious award and wasn't reprinted until 2014, um, which was about a year or two before I needed a book like that to, to, to research for my, for my novel. Um, the reason my Roman bracelet is on it there is because um, it's, I used it so much, it won't stay shut if there isn't a weight on the front cover. 
Um, you've got Livy as well, one of the major sources for the time. And then I don't know if any of you know the, the wonderful magazine, Ancient Warfare. It's sister, um, there's a civilian, a, a civilian version of it as well called Ancient History, as well as a medieval one. And all written by academics, you know, mentioning the sources and so on. Really, really useful. Um, those are the very pe the people who uh, give me their images. Um, so just back to that battle at Atrax and, and what happened in 197. I, I generally, do, um, when I'm giving this talk, I don't give it away because the Battle of Kynos Kefale, which you all know about, was the, when the Romans defeated Philip conclusively. Um, I say I'm not going to talk about that because I want you to buy the second book. Um, but I'll, I will mention what happened um, in the spring of 197 BC. Um, Philip was in a bad place. Uh, he knew that um, the only way he could defeat the Romans was if he fought them on his terms. And um, the Romans, with a massive force of Aetolians, about 6,000 Aetolians, and so they were nearly 25% of the Roman forces, played a game of cat and mouse in, in the summer, early summer of 197, um, close to the Aegean, um, the Aegean shore on the southern border of Macedon and they ended up in this bizarre situation marching to and fro one army on the northern side of a range of hills the other army on the southern side neither knowing where they were a bit like Alexander and Darius um, before the Battle of Issus uh, um, because obviously there were no satellites no drones no planes you were reliant on scouts who ran and rode everywhere so it was very easy to be quite close to your enemy without knowing about it and the battle, um, Kynos Kefale, meaning the dog's heads, named because of the shape of the peaks of the mountains on which the battle took place. It was one of those really just unfortunate things for the Macedonians uh, anyway, of a battle that started as a skirmish and more and more troops got committed to it. And it ended up becoming a battle purely because, oh my goodness, the Romans have put more men in, we've got to put more men in. Oh, look, the Macedonians have put more men into the battle. We need to put more men in. And it became a full scale battle, which started out as a clash between scouts. And what happened was uh, that there was terrible weather. Philip um, was, was actually trying to set up camp when he was getting news that his men, his scouts, were fighting Roman scouts on the top of the mountain. And he, he sent in more and more men, and his men were absolutely hammering the Romans and driving them back down the far side of the hills towards the Roman camp. And what happened then was when he decided that uh, he would commit, he would commit his, some of his phalangists to defeat the Romans, because if he could roll them back into their camp, obviously he would win the battle. And the Roman general Flamininus realized that it was becoming spiraling out of control and mobilized his whole army and sent them up the mountain slope in among his retreating men and they met um half of philip's army as a phalanx and were being beaten backwards by them but what happened then was um the second half of philip's army uh was away um looking for supplies and they got an urgent message to come back and they came back um marching as fast as they could and came over the crest of the hill but they weren't they weren't linked up with the with with Philip's half of the phalanx. So you had essentially think of two squares, but one square is almost at a diagonal position to the other rather than beside it. And what happened was in the second half of that phalanx came marching down the hill, still with their spears unassembled. Um, the Romans sent their elephants up against them, but then what happened was um, a Roman officer who was going up to face this second body of phalangists, looked over to his left and he noticed that the, the, the Macedonians who were winning, driving his comrades down the hill, that their left flank was completely exposed. Remember how I mentioned when you're holding a, a big shield in front of you and a spear over your right shoulder, your left, your left, if you're on the left edge of a phalanx, your left side ex is exposed. If you're on the right side of a phalanx, your right side is exposed. So when this Roman officer saw the whole side of Philip's part of the phalanx exposed, he used his, his nous and the fact that uh, what helped him was the fact that the Roman legion was made up of maniples. So that's a double century. They, they were used to operating in small units. 
he took a two or three thousand men quick thinking and just smashed into the side of Philip's part of the phalanx and he splintered it into little bits uh, and, the, and they broke and they ran and then that meant that the the men who were still who were behind the second half of Philip's army who were trying to get to the battle they panicked they saw elephants they saw their comrades running away and they turned and ran away as well or they tried to fight and and but they were all broken up and what was tragic for the Macedonians was that the Romans didn't know battlefield chivalry of the time so if you were a Greek or a Macedonian back then and you were surrendering you didn't put your hands in the air what you did was you planted the butt of your spear in the ground with it pointing straight at the sky and that was the same as putting your hands in the air and you didn't get killed but the Roman legionaries didn't know that so they, they slaughtered thousands of unfortunate Macedonians who were trying to surrender uh, it was a it was a, a massive defeat for Philip he probably lost at least 5,000 men if not more and although he wasn't totally defeated the war came to an end soon after because um, he, he wanted to make terms and the Romans very intelligently knew that it was not a good idea to destroy him completely because they needed a strong power to act for them although they were you know wanted to control Macedon because east of Macedonia I mentioned the Seleucids so the the emperor of the Seleucid of the Seleucid power, his name was um, oh my goodness, it begins with an A. Ah, oh, slipped my mind. Oh, someone will tell me in a minute. I can't think of his name. Antiochus. He was a threat as well. The Romans knew he was. He had. In, he had. Uh, he had eyes and designs on on Macedonian Greece. So it was in the Romans' interest not to utterly defeat Philip. And in, in effect, he became their ally um, uh, as time went on. But his son was later to rise up against the Romans, and that was the war I referred to uh, that ended in 161. Uh, that was the Battle of Pydna. So that is a, a, a sort of reasonably fast canter through that 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 war. Um, there's a shameless plug. There's another plug about Lionheart. <laughs> um, I'll go back to I'll go back to that image, and uh, I thank you very much for your interest. And I will stop sharing now. And if any of you have questions, um, I would be very happy to answer them. Right. So I hope you all know if you go down to the bottom there, there's Q and A, um, and you can just type them in there, and I can answer them. I think Jackie may want to yeah. take charge of that. I don't know. Can I be seen now? I'm. A, I don't know if I can be seen now. You can yeah. Can be seen now. Yes. Yeah. No. Please do type in your your questions. Um, I know people have delayed, so there's there isn't there, there at the moment. Um, so I will say so. I will ask something, Ben. How do you think from what you said at the beginning about the importance of this battle? If the Romans had been defeated, how different do you think the next couple of hundred years would have looked? <laughs> I'd love to say they would have been. Thank you, Jackie. I'd love to say that they would have been very di different, but the Romans at that time were. They were at their sort of maximum period of of stubbornness. So <laughs> after Cannae, I mean, most ancient peoples, when they suffered a defeat as cataclysmic as as that, they just they just surrendered and did whatever they were told. They paid the tribute, they paid the gold, and gave the territory up. They didn't continue to fight. But the Romans famously um, told Hannibal's embassy, who came to Rome after after Cannae not while there is a foreign invader on our soil will we treat with you the same words they had told pyrrhus of epirus 60 years mm -hmm. before so if they'd been defeated at kynos Kefale, i think they would have just sent more legions over yes. and, and mm -hmm. they had a hundred thousand men who were combat veterans there was mm -hmm. no question that they would have, would have lost the war purely mm -hmm. because um philip could never replenish his men the way the romans could a bit like you know that was Hannibal's problem as well yeah. he was never able to to replenish his men after he lost them so mm. I don't think it would have changed history James. sadly oh interesting I've got I have got some questions now I've got one of my students actually is asking in your opinion who is the more successful leader Alexander the Great or Philip V thank you Murray uh, undoubtedly Alexander the Great I'm a bit of a fanboy of Alexander the Great because I do a talk on him as well actually uh, if you're ever interested um, his men marched 11,250 miles or 20,000 kilometers nearly over eight years and they fought a hundred battles in which they were never defeated <laughs> they were defeated by um, 
bad conditions and not wanting to cross a river and leave, you know potentially never go home that was when they refused to, to advance but they never lost a battle so um i mean you could call alexander a megalomaniac but he was quite extraordinary um second question sorry but could i put up again the shameless plug okay. um bear with me um shameless plug is my first non um roman book uh which came out this year oh, it's on lionheart. alex it's on lionheart there um so oh. so look it up it's on amazon it's on hive waterstones um yeah it's the first in a trilogy set in the 12th century um and uh, it was immense fun writing because i'd written 13 books set in ancient rome um so it was a joy to to actually leave rome for a little while because um, my publisher said to me, if you don't, um, if, you, if you keep writing about Rome, you know, you might get a bit bored. Do you think that's possible? And I said, well, no, I don't think so. And, th and they said to me, did you know that Bernard Cornwell stopped um, writing sharp novels for a few years because he got a bit bored with it? And this was his former editor telling me this. And I went, oh, I had no idea. And she said, well, why don't you? Why don't you? I said, Richard the Lionheart. She said, great. Um, and then she said, do you want to write some Roman books after that? And I went, yeah. And she said, there you go. So so I'm, I'm hoping to go back to my Hannibal series because I've never oh, finished it. Um, excellent, yes. Yeah. Well, my, my husband's listening downstairs, so I hope he's getting some ideas for my Christmas present. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please, please do put up some more questions. Um, the other thing, Ben, that um, how on earth did they carry those massive spears into battle? They, I was gobsmacked by the size of those. Yeah, they're quite incredible, aren't they? So, yes. so, and they had, they were in two parts. So they were essentially nine to two parts, nine to ten feet long, which you carried over your shoulder. And when you were about to deploy into battle, you had to screw the two of them together, probably lying on the ground because they're so long. And then you had to walk holding it. Yes. Um, yeah, so it must have been terribly unwieldy. I mm. hope someday to go over to Germany and meet that German unit. They've got about mm. thirty of them. So, that, you know, no, you'd love to see obviously hundreds of them, but even, I hope the picture of just even six or eight of them, you know, it's hard even to take a shot that, that yeah. shows you, but you can just get an impression of how properly scary it would be to charge a formation of men with, with 20 foot long spears. Absolutely, yes. I see somebody has, uh, is asking here, what comes first, the history or the imagination? Um, oh, a lot of authors answer the imagination, but I'm a total history nerd. I hope that came across. <laughs> I, I just, I can look at any period of history. So I'm not totally obsessed with the Romans. Well, I am, but I'm also obsessed by all history. So if I go into a museum or I go into a stately home or, you know, see and read a newspaper article, um, I, I'll start thinking about what I could write about it. So but but when you when you look at the amazing events of history, so when I saw when I was doing my research about this war and I saw that nobody had actually written a trilogy or any books about it, certainly in the last 50 years, I, I actually did jump up and down because with excitement um, because the events, they just they just speak uh, to me. You know, there's a um, there's a quote for, which I used in the book, which is. Um, so those Macedonian soldiers were obviously very brave men, used to winning battles, but the, the, the Gladius Hispaniensis that the legionaries used at the time, um, it is recorded in Livy that they were so terrified of that Roman sword uh, because of the ease with which it removed arms, legs, and heads. And so everyone thinks that the Roman sword was just a thrusting weapon. Well, it wasn't because there's the proof in Livy. Um, yeah, it's really, so things like that, you know, I just, they're just gold dust to put in the book. And when you move into the 12th century, um, what I couldn't get over was, you'll all know, you know, you read your, your uh, Suetonius or your whoever, Livy, uh, all the Roman sources, they're frequently partial. They're often just sometimes only a line here, here or there. Very frustrating, like having a thousand piece jigsaw with hundreds of pieces missing. But when you get to the 12th century, like I did with Lionheart, and you've got whole books that survive. So I just finished the second book, which is about the, the crusade when Richard went to the Holy Land. And there are no less than five contemporary accounts surviving, two Muslim and three Christian. And lots of the Muslim ones confirm what the Christian ones said and vice versa. So we know it's true. Um, so I was like a child in a toy shop with with um, writing the, the the second Lionheart book. So history first for me, but my imagination's bubbling away in the background the whole time as well. Thank you. 
Um, anybody else like to ask anything at all? Well, it seems. Somebody said, but I'm not sure what it did meant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know what it did meant. No, the history know. came However, first. <laughs> no, no, I'm not too sure. That it was a reply to something you said. Um, oh, there's another question. It's just come in. Oh, another one just come in. Um, oh, did the Romans make much use of elephants in battle? And uh, no, they didn't. Is a simple answer. Um, so the, the they were a, a very dangerous thing to have. If they were well trained and they took years to train, they were very effective. They could be, but they could, if they weren't well trained, they could turn on your own army or just flee through the ranks of the enemy, like Hannibal's elephants did at Zama. So the Romans first faced them when Pyrrhus of Epirus shipped them on 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 rafts over from. Um, from modern day Albania. And he, he beat the Romans with them a couple of times, but they learned how to fight him very quickly and possibly even used flaming pigs against them, mm. i.e. coating pigs in pitch, setting them alight and driving them at the elephants. And the elephants hear the screaming, burning pigs and run away. Um, so one of the only times the Romans used elephants, they didn't use them against Hannibal, um, uh, because when he invaded Italy, only had one that survived anyway. And then when they when they got when they took over Carthage, they, they may have taken some, but they certainly didn't use them much. The main use I know of the Romans using them was in the civil war between um, when Caesar was in Egypt fighting Republican forces. So the Battle of Thapsus, uh, there were elephants used against him there by other Romans. And um, what's extraordinary. Um, a lovely little detail that survived is that there's a recorded instance in that battle of a legionary being plucked in the air by an elephant in the trunk and being swung around and obviously about to die and one of his comrades attacked that elephant with a sword and saved his friend if whatever he did he hacked the elephant's trunk or he did something to it and it dropped his friend and he and he saved his life and um, I use that in a book. I mean, you know, you can't not. <laughs> but that's one of the only instances I know of where the Romans used used elephants. Um, they continued to be um, used. Um, so they were brought from India originally um, by probably by Alexander and used by, you know, his his breakaway generals, the Seleucids and the Lysimachians and the Ptolemies used them against each other in the 300s and uh, BC and the late 290s BC. And you had the Carthaginians using forest elephants, uh, which were a now extinct breed from the forests of North Africa, which are also now gone. Um, but the Romans didn't really didn't really um, use them very much. How long did I spend researching each book versus writing? Um, it varies widely. So by the time I was writing the novels about Philip and Flamininus, they were my 12th and 13th Roman novels. My background knowledge of of Rome in the Republic up to the early Principate is, is fairly extensive. Although I'm always a little wary when giving talks to classics associations, because that's what you what you all do. But, um, you know, I've got hundreds, about 300 textbooks on ancient Rome. So with each book, I didn't have to do much research on, you know, ordinary life, food, religion, marriage, death. I just had to research the historical events. So you're talking probably only a few weeks research and then a, and research on the hoof while I'd be writing the book. But when I came to write this Richard the Lionheart novel, I did three months of solid research, doing nothing five days a week, but reading textbooks and, you know, medieval sources. And then because my knowledge of the medieval period isn't, you know, wasn't as good as Rome, I, I wrote that book. And I would have no less than six to ten open textbooks on my desk every day. And literally, I'd only write a paragraph and then I'd have to go and look something up. But I, I the last five or six, seven books, I always get an academic to read my book before it goes to the publisher. A Roman academic in the case of the, the last five Roman ones and, and uh, an Angevin um, scholar, medieval scholar for my Richard the Lionheart books, because, you know, it's. I take most, like most historical novelists, I take huge pride and, and make great effort to be as accurate as I can in everything, language, social custom, military equipment, religious observances, burial rituals, you know, toys that children used um, and so on. And so um, fortunately using the, you know, those, those um, barrier, what do you call them? Safety nets. 
Um, but I'm happy to say there usually aren't too many major gaffes, but, um, but I always make, try to make sure by, by getting an academic to read my books before they go to print. And they, they're, they're, they're always mistakes creep in. So I, always, I put in my notes at the end, look, there will be mistakes here. I've done my best. You know, if you, if you find one, please tell me and I'll have it rectified or whatever. So. You see, Thomas, there's another question here. How ruthless were the Romans against the Macedonians? Um, well, it depends on your definition of, of ruthlessness in that um, pretty much everybody 2,000 years ago, right up until very recently, when you defeated another civilization or people, you didn't treat them very nicely. You could argue that they treated the Macedonians better than the Carthaginians, for example, though, and especially after the third Punic War, when they razed Carthage to the ground. They did not salt the fields, I'll quickly mention, um, uh, but they left Philip in power and they didn't leave a military force permanently in Greece. They pulled, they pulled back after, uh, to, to Italy after about a year, year and a half. And uh, although they continued to manipulate and um, rule uh, at a distance, and then after, the, after Philip's son rose up, they occupied Macedon and Greece and, and made it into a province. Um, for a good number of decades after that Battle of Kynos Kefale, the average Macedonian and indeed a lot of Greeks wouldn't really have known that the Romans were were their masters. It wasn't until that 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 last war against Macedon and then the sacking of um, Thebes, no Corinth, sorry, the sacking of Corinth in the 140s BC, which was recognised by lots of Romans as being totally barbaric. It was when a Roman general literally raised it to the ground because the Thebans had decided, um, do you know what? We don't like the Romans being our bosses. It was about 80 years too late but uh, it was raised to the ground and thousands of people were enslaved and so um, that was when the mailed fist of Rome was really exposed but but for many years after Kainos Kefale I don't think a lot of Greeks and Macedonians would have known much different um, so they weren't they didn't for that period anyway treat them as badly as they might have done the Carthaginians uh, you know in um, at a similar time um, <laughs> There's a question here from Anna Welsh, um, who is an archaeologist, actually. She asks, do you research solely from historical accounts uh, and research, or do you look at archaeological research too? That's an interesting one. Um, I try to look at archaeological research, but um, several things militate against it. One is that the nature of archaeological articles and indeed historical research articles is such that they're in they're often really short and they're in magazines like JSTOR and so on. Um, and they're really hard, often really hard to find. So if you want to know about a little settlement somewhere in Macedonia or in Montenegro, if you're on JSTOR all the time, you might find it. But I, I've, I've, well, I'm, I am a member of it now, um, but I have found I have it historically had great problems trying to find the kind of articles that I sort of suspect are out there, but I don't know if they are because I'm not an archaeologist. And so um, I, I visit most of the places I write about, not always, but it, often. Um, so I've been to Kynos Kefale, I've walked the ground, I've been, I haven't been to Apollonia, unfortunately, um, or the mountain passes, that didn't happen, but I've been to the area of the battles uh, where those and the attracts and so on um, and all my previous books like the Varian disaster I've been to all the battlefield sites and all the Roman forts and I walk the ground and so I love archaeology and the finds and I love museums and I do my best but I I I, I feel a bit flummoxed by um, the articles that, that that must be out there on on um, places like JSTOR and other uh, academic websites I probably don't even know about. So <laughs> any any help or advice on that gratefully received. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think that looks to be it on the questions. So I think, Ben, I think what I do now is I hand back to Tony. So I think Tony should appear in a moment. Hi. Oh, there he is. Oh, hello. Ben, may, may I thank you very much indeed for the fascinating uh, speech, presentation, 
your illustrations were absolutely superb and the uh, the knowledge you showed over uh, uh, this this period of uh, of greek and roman history uh was really uh, uh, stupendous thank you very much indeed um may i uh, i imagine there's been a lot of applause coming but we won't be able to hear it from our audience <laughs> uh, may i wish our uh, listeners our, um, our members etc a very happy christmas indeed and a very good new year without uh, this coronavirus we hope very shortly uh, we hope to have uh, resume uh, certainly at least with um, a zoom webinar for our next um, uh, uh, lecture uh, in february and that's um robert parker professor robert parker um in in due course but we will give you further information about that so thank you all um i don't think there's anything else here uh, to say so i wish you all as i say a very good christmas thank, thank you, you.